Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Our Wings Podcast Project. My name is Martin Wilsey, and Dave Keener is going to be driving the bus tonight. Take it away, Dave. All right. Our topic tonight is anthologies. Basically, how to produce them, why you might want to, what it's going to take, what are some of the practical things to deal with. So I'm going to start off with, before you're, you even announce that you're going to do an anthology, you have a whole bunch of setup stuff to take care of in advance, right? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it out to you guys as a question. What do you think you need to set up in advance? And then I'm going to comment on that. Well, first oh, I off, I, you got to decide what the theme is for an anthology. I would have said. If it's got a theme, a genre, yeah. you know, because some um, anthologies I've seen, they, they don't really have a theme mm -hmm. at all. You know, they'll have science fiction stories and memoirs and romances all in the same anthology. Um, yeah. Some of um, our first anthologies were like that. Nice, yeah, right? so um, I actually prefer an anthology to be thematic, whether it's all zombie apocalypse stories or mm -hmm. all uh, uh, science fiction fantasy stories about a theme. Um, that's I my agree. preference. So the first thing to do is decide on um, what the topic is. What the Another thing is. is, do you have a volunteer editor who's willing yes. to, to do that, to do, put in the time, uh, maybe it's yourself, but uh, do you have one? Yeah, and keep in mind, the editor here is not just the person that proofreads. This is the person that goes to all the submissions. Okay, that, so yeah. that's maybe one of the things you got to decide up front, too. It, mm -hmm. Are you going to do a professional anthology? If that's the case, then it requires a professional paid editor for the whole anthology, just Agreed. so it, it was a novel. But if you're a writer's group that's trying to uh, put together an anthology for the members, which, you know, our writer's group does exactly that. And in mm -hmm. fact, I got, I've got one of them. Just here's an example of one of the anthologies that we have done with the Hourlings. And, um, <laughs> I can't show it. Dave and his no. invisible books. I love that. Anyway. <laughs> Either um, I'm invisible or the books are invisible. I, I can't do both. Okay. <laughs> and then you have to decide your timeline. When yeah. you want to release, when you want your first deadline to be, your second deadline to be, etc. And try to make your deadlines hard. I mean, don't let them shift because they, they shift a little. They could shift a lot. The only reason you might want to extend it out is... If you're a little light on submissions, you might want to do that. But I can almost I have filled on that. I have I have yeah. also had an anthology rather substantially delayed due to a, a pandemic. Yeah, pandemics. Well, oof. yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to comment on a couple of things that we've said. Um, I agree that a theme is something that you need to work on as soon as possible. I mean, ultimately, it's not just a theme. You're going to have to market this. And who are you marketing it to? What's, what's your audience? It's hard to, to simultaneously reach zombie lovers and romance lover, lovers and urban fantasy folks uh, and detective folks all, all in one anthology. So who, who are you marketing it for? Right. Um, staff, who's going to work on the anthology? I, I can run it solo. I know how. <laughs> I would rather not. Um, and how are they going to get paid? If it's a professional anthology, there should be money involved. That means you're paying the writers. That means you're paying whoever's working with you. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, uh, I have teamed up with uh, Donna Royston, uh, and uh, she is uh, she she provides the copy editing and the editing. Uh, I also do the editing, and I do most of the management of the of, of the authors uh, and the manuscripts that come in. So I've decided that up front, um, and we work pretty well together on that. Um, and we both we don't get paid per se, we take a share of uh, all the royalties that come in. So we, we are getting paid, but that, that is built into how the anthology is set up. Um, mm. And then you have to, I think, decide if you're going to pay. If you're going to pay, what are you going to pay? Are you paying full professional rates, which are now um, eight cents a word? I, I'm not quite up to the sales level where I can afford that. Uh, I've been paying a higher royalty, a higher initial royalty with each anthology. And then I pay ongoing royalties after the um, anthology is published. And the, the timeline, the schedule, that's definitely key. You gotta, you gotta have that. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of business decisions up front. Mm -hmm. And um, the artistic decisions, I always consider it starting at the call for submissions, mm -hmm. which you need to really uh, spend some time to put together a good call for submissions. Absolutely. Because yeah. it, it is basically an advertisement for uh, mm -hmm. writers to to attract good writers to actually submit stories for it. Describe what you want to make sure that you're not going to get erotica if you're not asking for it, you know? I think uh, calls for submissions are helped when uh, the cover art is ready because I think it helps authors envision themselves inside that book. I have failed at that with both of my current, uh, but my first anthology and my second one, I was not able to get the cover art in time. For my third one, uh, yes, I would like to get the cover art as soon as possible, um, preferably with the call for submissions because it, it does make it easier on, on the authors yep. and on the advertising, honestly. Mm -hmm. That is true. It they want to be in that book if it's a good, if it's a good cover. Picture, a thousand words. Yeah, if nothing else, especially if you're not paying like full professional rates, um, you want to have an author look at this and go, ooh, ooh, this is a good credential. This is going to look good. I, I can show this to my friends and family, and they'll be proud. If, if you can't, uh, if you can't, uh, it you would like make it look good. And I, I will say this: if you are going to do a call for submissions to the public, and it, it, you can use things like Duotrope and the Grinder, the submission grinder, uh, you can get all those things. You will get a lot of submissions. Submission to, Grinder. In terms of, you'll, you'll also have to come up with a filtering system. Yeah, yeah, there's actually several websites that you can post your calls for submissions on. Mm -hmm. um, but be advised, you'll get a lot of submissions, mm -hmm. which means you have to read a lot of submissions. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. Do you, um, do you read your submissions word for word, or do you know within the first couple pages whether it's up to par? Uh, it's the ones that are easy to reject. Um, or you can see it right up front. Right. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. If they're, can, bad, they're bad. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the eye rollers, you just right. shake yeah. your head and send them a form letter. But the uh, ones that are in the middle take you a long time, right? Yeah. Well, well you if, you know, if you start reading it and it's got a, you know, a good hook in the beginning and the prose is good, and, you know, if it's engaging, then you read the, uh, you end up reading the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, ones, the ones that are, are really good are very easy to read, mm -hmm. even, if, even if you do detect that it needs editing or a few slight changes. The ones in the middle are more work. What, you know, uh, a story that has a really good premise or maybe is just got a, a plot hole here or there, needs some tweaking, you know, interacting with the author and telling them, look, you are really close to getting upset, accepted here if you can change this and this and this. So right. mentoring an author takes a lot more time and energy um, than just flat out accepting or rejecting stories. And, and also, I think, I think it's in the middle. It really should Consider that you might need to spend that time to, you know, say, hey, look, I kind of like this, but if you change this, this, and this, it's good enough. Otherwise, no. So in interestingly, that's also an effective budget. So if, if you're paying eight cents a word, um, you are, quite frankly, getting some of the top writers, um, and you're getting a different caliber of story often. Uh, it, it, it is still possible for a good writer to turn in a, a you know, a trunk story or or something where he, he rushed it through and it just it's just not up to, to par. Um, but I find um, paying um, a lower rate means I'm getting probably more stories that may, may need some work. Um, I think one of the things that I've, I found useful is actually editorial comments to authors via Zoom. Because then it's not this impersonal. Here's all these all these criticisms of the story um, on, on a marked up uh, word document. Here's here's the editor explaining why and what what he wants. 
Uh, and that has worked out pretty pretty well for me in terms of getting what I want for stories. But the story needs to be at a certain level before I can really, really do that. So it's a lot of work. That's more than a lot of anthologies would do too for, uh, yeah. for submitters. Well, and that's where it gets interesting too, because the other thing you can do is you can do curated, mm -hmm. uh, meaning I have select pre-selected some of the people that I want to submit stories. It doesn't mean that I will accept them, but it means that um, I have a pretty good idea that certain people have a chance at getting into the anthology. And I, and you know, so uh, Marty is on my go-to list for providing stories. If I don't like it, I'm not accepting it, but I haven't rejected him yet. Mm -hmm. um, so my first anthology was like, um, basically it was uh, novelettes and uh, there were only five stories in it. Well, I had four, I needed one more. So I, I put out a call for just that, just filling that one slot. Um, my next one is probably going to be about half curated and half uh, out to the public. So that's kind of one way in, of stacking the, the deck a little bit in the editor's favor. Um, so the call for, well, actually, let's, let me ask this. Number one reason for somebody being rejected. What do you think it is? Not, uh, not staying on genre. Not following the guidelines. Yeah, it's just clean not following the guidelines. Yeah, that's I say erotica, and you give me erotica. I'm, yeah, I'm rejecting it. If I say you know, second world fantasy, no urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. give me then, fantasy. If it's mm -hmm. right there in the document that you took the time to craft says none of this and it's there done or, or my my personal favorite from zombies from uh, marty's experience no zombie erotica mm -hmm. Dude. yeah and then it's you get right zombie erotica there. oh <laughs> man we'll talk later <laughs> okay. yeah. well, i remember those stories so how many submissions do you get uh let's see for uh, my current anthology which was Mostly curated. I didn't put it out to the wide public. I put it out to uh, writing groups in this area, uh, and also I have a friend who's in the in a writing group in Atlanta. So I put it out to his writing group. So uh, fifteen. You got fifteen submissions from all that, and how many did you accept? Uh, so far, eleven. Wow. Okay. So that's that's a pretty high acceptance rate. That should be encouraging for people. Well, again, but that was partly curated. Um, from writing groups who are full of, of people who are, are working very diligently and professionally to upgrade their craft. Uh, and there were some stories that weren't quite where I wanted them, but I was able to work with them and, and help them get them to the level that I wanted. So that, did those numbers change with your next anthology that was not curated? Uh, well, it also means I've been a little bit light on content for a while, which is one of the delays in getting the, this current mm -hmm. anthology out. So my next one, I'm going to try about half curated and half out to the public, which means I'm probably going to get 100 or, or 150 or more submissions. Wow. I'm not really looking forward to that. Yeah, for for this uh, anthology that I uh, produced uh, with zombie apocalypse stories, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've got over 300 submissions, which, right. you know, which is nice in some sense, but man, it was a lot of work. And um, whittling it down to a book, you know, trying to keep it a reasonable length, um, I ended up publishing it at just over 400 pages. And um, I still had good stories, so I ended up having a volume two of it also. Um, right. Instead of just throwing away all the other submissions. But yeah, there is, it is a total bell curve of... Uh, of submissions and it turned out to be a lot more work than I thought it was going to be honestly. Although, although it is kind of gratifying when I when I have helped somebody take a story to the next level um, or one of the things that is interesting and difficult about my current anthology which is the uh, that I'm working on um, the forever in mm -hmm. it's actually a setting uh, which means some characters from from a story may appear in other stories and there is it, it, it turns out that there is sort of a 
um, a theme that is going for some of the characters uh, that is going through some of the stories. Uh, and that has been, um, I think the end result will be really, really cool, but it has been a pain in the butt to try to put it together. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, um, I, th I think covers are also a little bit easier for anthologies. You don't have to actually match a scene from the story, you have to match the theme. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, editing, I think we've, we've kind of covered editing. Um, uh, I think it's also important to have a process. So Marty, you've done anthology. Let's talk about a little bit about your process of uh, taking um, authors through the flow from reading, from getting their submission to uh, accepting it and actually paying them. Right, well, it, Got refined over the over the, you know. I did my first anthology. I learned a lot of lessons. And in fact, um, you have to have you really have to have a contract for um, uh, authors for your anthologies. Um, you know, make it it very clear in in context and expectations and everything and. Um, be clear about that. And if they're not willing to sign, you need to get the signature on that contract yeah. early because you don't want to spend a lot of man hours massaging yeah. and integrating a story. And somebody says, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Right. Um, so got to get that, you know, get that kind of uh, um, um, uh, contract in early. Um, that's one lesson that I did learn. Um, other thing is, is that, you know, you have to make it clear to the authors um, the level of editorial, you know, uh, modifications that um, mm -hmm. you will make um, without, you know, consulting them. You know, for me, it was pretty much fixing typos, grammar, punctuation, and uh, stuff like that. And I would send the finished story back to the author and give them 10 days to, um, to reply to, to me to say yay or nay. It, it's, a, it's a nay at that point. Luckily, I never got any, no, I don't, you can't do that. I'm not gonna do it. I did get a case where um, I sent it back to them for final approval and they said, Oh, dude! I can't. I I already sold this story. I, you know, and uh, it's, like, it's like, dude, you know, you already signed the contract. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, man. It, you know, they were yeah, going to yeah. publish it before you. So that was a, you know. So that's a, that's a no no if you're if you're a writer. Mm -hmm. um, if I do some work to help get the story ready and I, and I, I've sent you a contract. And I find out that you've sent it somewhere else, and you've accepted them instead of me. I will never publish you again. Don't bother sending me. That's this right. Ever. That's, a, that's exactly up. right. Agreed. And um, and you know, in the contract, it makes it clear, um, you know, the payments and uh, everybody's, you know, address, legal names as opposed to pseudonyms have mm -hmm. to be played out. You can't have pseudonyms in contracts, mm -hmm. um, but you need to make allowances for their author name because, you know, you can have your author name, whatever it is, and you got to be specific about the author name um, because you want their author name to be associated with their story on Amazon um, because it will just sell more of the anthologies. Um, yeah, my, my contract has some specified... Um, I want their address. I want their email. I want their name, their real name. That's that's for signature purposes. I want to know the name of of, of um, their name as a published author. Do they want to be their initials? Do they want to be a pseudonym? Tell me what it is. Um, all of that is. I'm going to do my best to pay them now and in the future because I I do pay royalties for as long as the anthology is in print. And this contract tells me where to contact you. 
it's also up to the author to make sure that I'm kept current with that information. Um, if you move or change your email address and stuff like that, because I, I will do my best to pay you, but I'm not a miracle worker. Locking in rights is another issue. I mean, your contract will specify, do I own this story? I either write to publish it exclusively forever in perpetuity, or maybe just a year. You might- I, I would never do that. Yeah, I would never do that either. Um, you do want, you know, a certain period of time for exclusive rights. And you also want um, perpetual <laughs> rights to be able to publish in Kindle, in paperback, hardcover, and audio um, uh, for as long as, as long as you want. Um, right. But the well, actual then, rights then, revert well, back to the authors so that if they want to sell their story again or do something else with the story, that's fine. I would uh, offer a little suggestion to people submitting to anthologies. Um, I, I think that there is a, a misconception that when you receive a contract, you either take it or leave it. And that's and if, you, if you request any changes or anything, you're out of line and you'll be rejected. Um, I don't think that's professional. I mean, I'm, cer I'm certain that there are some contracts that are very uh, non-negotiable, but um, you know, with my situation with the Hourlings, um, when I got an agent, that agent, you know, has to, she has to have full transparency of every contract I enter into as far as a uh, literary work. And so she had some changes for my own writing group's contract. And, uh, you know, I submitted them and there was a little bit of confusion at first. Some people were thinking, you know, well, you're not allowed to do that. You know, we're all, we all signed the same contract. Well, why are you changing, you know, that we can't do that. Um, but that's, I don't think that's true. And uh, I, I encourage authors to read the contract. And if it doesn't, you know, if there's something that you need changed, uh, it's okay to ask for a change that, you know, the publisher can reject it and say, no, we can't so, do that. But it's okay to have a conversation. I have, I'm okay with you asking questions. It may be that you have an idea for the contract that is a change that I think is, should become part of my new standard. Maybe um, the contract actually the contract if it's done properly and mine was based originally on the the the, the very favorable contract from uh, the science fiction writers of America um, should protect me the editor and make it clear what rights I'm taking and for how long uh, and it should protect the author and specify exactly what they're getting um, at the same time I really want one contract for all of my authors. And if you have suggestions that will make it better for everybody, then I, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I'm already on version like 1.3 uh, of my uh, standard anthology contract as, as I figure out how to, to improve things. So I'm always welcome to, I always welcome suggestions, but at the same time, I have, I, I'm running a business with these anthologies and the contract is there for a reason. Uh, and if you don't like it, uh, uh, well, there's somebody else that wants to get that story published too. Yeah, yeah but I, I think, think that, that contract. Be, I mean, maybe is, you're that way, but I think it would. Be I think contract-related issues I, I was are say, more I notable I, for 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 novels than for. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. the stories are pretty cut and dried, um, both for um, both for anthologies and for. Um, the typical um, magazines like Analog, you know, and science fiction, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, ultimately I'm gonna take um, world uh, serial rights, uh, first world serial rights uh, for say a year uh, during which your story has to be exclusive with me. Uh, after that, it's not exclusive. You can do whatever you want with it. You can sell it to somebody else. You can put in another anthology, you can publish it solo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the contract also gives me responsibilities for, for ongoing uh, royalties to my writers on, you know, every I think writers months. have a right to no, be comfortable with the contract, though, and that we should not, as publishers, mistake requests for changes as a lack of enthusiasm or a lack of good intention. I mean, you know, in my situation, I was psyched to be in that anthology and was very grateful. And, you know, it was just a couple of things I need to be comfortable um, so I don't think that that means that the author is necessarily like, you know, not, not passionate and not totally into it with you and wants to be in your book. And 
you know, if, and if it's a well, well-written this story, all, I think this all just speaks to the fact how important it is to have a very clear and concise contract. Yes, um, and, and we won't go over all the terms of a, of a contract, yeah. but there's some fairly cut and dried stuff that has to be in it, mm -hmm. um, basically to protect both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we're, we were talking about the process before, um, about you know, you know, editorial changes, getting the changes back from the uh, from the, the author, um, sending the contract, getting the signed contract out. I I, I require the signed contract out uh, back to me before I send out a, a check, for example. Uh, that's pretty standard practice. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, there is production, which is the formats. Um, as Marty alluded to, we typically, I typically publish in uh, trade paperback, ebook, and hardcover uh, with maybe audio in the future. Um, Podcast on that. And I, I think there's different business models for anthologies. So Marty, talk a little bit about yours. Well, my anthologies, I kept them simple. Um, um, basically, the business process was collecting stories that are thematically uh, similar. Um, my contract model was a uh, single payment to the author. Um, I would get exclusive rights for six months, and then the rights would revert back to the author, but no additional royalties would be paid to them. It would be a single payment um, mm -hmm. per... Um, uh, amount per word um, and um, uh, you know a lot of people that um, submitted to the anthology um, were not all about the money because the anthologies honestly if you're a professional author trying to earn a living anthologies is not going to be the way to do it um, mm -hmm. but you know people like to have additions into their uh, catalog onto their author page on Amazon and anthologies mm -hmm. is a good way to do that. So a lot of people were pretty excited about it. And um, I did two zombie apocalypse uh, novels and then uh, a time travel anthology. And um, I ran them all the same, just like that. And um, authors were happy to uh, be able to say, hey, you know, I'm a professional author now. Uh, even though that, you know, in the end, it, I don't have to, uh, um, do the management associated with uh, monitoring and providing royalty statements and everything like that for every individual author. So that's the major difference between um, the anthologies that I've done and the ones that Dave has done. In fact, what Marty does is typical. What Dave is doing is a very nice courtesy. Uh, so Marty, Marty, has, Marty has done a perfectly fine model. Um, I am, I am aiming at uh, gradually bootstrapping myself up to uh, much more higher paying anthologies. And I'm pretty much kind of going uh, as I would like to be going in, in the future. Um, so I, I, the, the amount that I pay per story is a flat rate, uh, but it's been going up with every anthology uh, and I pay royalties. Uh, so uh, each editor gets a share and each author gets a share per story. Uh, again, other people uh, run their models a little bit differently, and that's perfectly valid. All right. Have I missed any topics? Miscellaneous? Well, we could discuss um, the opposite end of the coin. As an author submitting to an anthology, what what do you need to do? Um, what, I, what I would say for that is read the call for submissions. Yeah. Stay on topic. Make sure you fit the criteria. That can include, you know, simple things like word count. You know, mm -hmm. if they say in the call for submissions, you know, limit 5,000 words, don't send them that's a 15,000 word story. Yeah, um, that's a hard it'll, limit. It'll be, be rejected. Um, so if they say word, if they say double spaced, if they say courier, do it. It may sound trivial, but that's what they're asking for. Right, a lot of a lot of the calls for submissions want very very specific formatting for their submissions. Um, 
to just make it easy to integrate into their anthologies. Because if you have a lot of advanced formatting on your submissions, it can turn into a hassle for the person that's got to assemble. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is oftentimes uh, there will be a line in there that says must be new, i.e., yes, you will get your rights back to this submission that you've given to us, but you may have done that before. This may not be a new piece because it's been published before. I'm not buying reprints. Right. Well, that specifically solicit them. I'm not buying reprints. It needs to be an original story. Mm -hmm. Right. And so make sure you just read all that as, as an author that submits to uh, anthologies, just make sure you read those in advance and um, are aware. Mm -hmm. And, and you have the, the, the submission grinder and do a trope. And there is something cool as an editor, there is something cool uh, when, I, when I put out a call for papers and I get a story that's good from somebody that I've never met before in my mm -hmm. life. That is very cool. Mm -hmm. I like so it. That's one of the reasons I like doing anthologies. That is very cool. Besides, of course, I plan to get rich doing them. Probably not. <laughs> All right. I can't think of anything else. I'm sure we've, we've skimmed over a few topics related to anthologies. Um, but I think that they can be pretty rewarding to do. Uh, and I've actually learned a lot by doing them and working with uh, other writers and I, I rather enjoy that and and I will add that uh, when you write short stories versus novels there aren't that many venues and anthologies are one of them so consider anthologies that's right well that wraps it for this week uh, make Indeed. sure uh, you stop back and we'll see you again next week mm -hmm. thanks for stopping in ciao <laughs>